What's up, guys? All right. We are talking financing mobile home parks tonight. Well, what I'm excited to do is give you an inside scoop on one of the most common questions that everybody asks me. And forgive the background. I'm in a hotel room traveling to meet with owner with an owner to uh, buy their community. Um, so have to work with the setup that I've got. Uh, but anyways, we're going to be talking about financing mobile home parks in 2023, which is definitely different than it has been over the years. So stick around. I've got a lot of good stuff. And most importantly, I'm going to be at answering questions throughout this discussion. So don't, um, don't, uh, don't think that, you know, you got to wait till the end to get your question answered. You can actually drop them in the comments and uh, I'll be answering them as they come in. Um, we are going to get started here. Um, one thing that, you know, a lot of people ask about is they ask me, have, you know, are there lenders, are there banks who will finance these mobile home parks? Because I'm not sitting on tons of cash to be able to go out and buy these things cash. And they seem like such a unique property type. You know, it's a lot different than financing a house, right? So when you finance a house, it's pretty straightforward and predictable. Well, it's not when you go into the world of commercial real estate, especially a niche property type like mobile home parks. 2023 is definitely, in late 2022 even, has definitely changed things a lot with interest rates and all the other craziness that's going on. Hey guys, drop in the comments what questions you have and uh, I will be answering them throughout the evening while we're talking. I'm going to keep it somewhat short tonight. We're not going to go super long, so get them in the comments as soon as possible so I make sure to get to them. But, um, yeah, I mean, right now there's such a huge opportunity to take advantage of the mobile home park uh, industry and the property type itself. And so if you've been thinking about it, if you've been considering buying mobile home parks, like right now is the time that you should be doing. And I know like you hear these other uh, real estate gurus and everything on social media, like, yeah, now's the best time to buy real estate. Well, not necessarily real estate in general, but I would say this property type specifically because they are getting bought up. They are being gobbled up by professional owners from a lot of the long-term mom and pop owners who have built them and aren't really so concerned about maxing out the value of the property or maxing out, you know, how much cash flow they produce because they own them free and clear. They built them with their own hands and it's a lifestyle business for them. So, you know, taking a lifestyle business from somebody else and then bringing in professional uh, systems and industry best practices and things like that, you get a lot of upside created. So you're not going to have that same upside opportunity 10 years from now, seven years from now, who knows, five years from now, I'm not sure. I don't know how long the consolidation is going to take, but what I can tell you is that it's happening and that there's a lot of opportunity and a lot of upside left in these deals that the current owners are leaving there for us. So take advantage of it. One of the most important things of getting these deals done is the financing aspect of it. So that's what we're going to go over tonight. Hey, real quick, before we dive into the details on the financing, um, come join me. I'm going to be in Lafayette, Louisiana. Um, I said that kind of weird. I'm going to be in Lafayette, Louisiana at Chris Rude's house. Um, and so he's got an event that he's putting on and it's going to be limited seating. This is going to be a really awesome evening where we're going to be talking mobile home parks, real estate. Uh, as he always says, skilling up. I'm taking that from him. That's his thing. But uh, he's going to be helping everybody skill up and it's going to be great networking. Again, that's in Lafayette, Louisiana, and that is on April 27th. I'm going to be there speaking. We're going to be talking about all this stuff in tons more detail and it's going to be great networking. Um, you can contact Chris Rude to get a seat. I guarantee the seats are not going to last long just because he just announced it I want to say yesterday or the day before and these normally fill up, but being that Chris is big into mobile home parks and so am I, the topic is just going to be, uh, going to be hot. It will be raw and rude for sure. <laughs> um, so I'll drop in the comments, uh, Chris's, Chris's contact info so that you guys can contact him. And, um, actually I'm just going to put his name. You can look him up. Just tell him I sent you 
for the event you want to you want to seat. Uh, many of you guys already know who Chris is, so it's not like a um, it's not a uh, you guys are probably already following him. Anyways, all right. So get with Chris Rude to get to the event in Lafayette, Louisiana, April twenty uh, seventh. It's a one day thing. It's going to be fire. Um, also, if you guys want to invest in mobile home parks and have someone actually like help you do it, be hands on and learn super in detail how to do this the right way and um, be successful at it, go to uh, shoot me a DM or a private message, the word learn to me, uh, or go to getrealcashflow.com and learn more. I've got a bunch of students that I'm helping actually go out and successfully buy their first mobile home parks. I bought uh, a lot of them and uh, have built a pretty sizable portfolio. So I'm going to, I teach it from experience, not from textbook or, you know, YouTube. You can also go to YouTube too and learn, but it's not going to get you where you need to go in order to ultimately build what you're trying to build. Can't buy multi-million dollar assets off of YouTube videos and Instagram reels. So uh, uh, DM me or private message me the word learn or go to getrealcashflow.com to learn more about that. All right. So let's talk about financing mobile home parks and how to actually do it right now in 2023. So here's the thing. What a lot of people don't realize, and you guys can drop in the comments below um, if you want some uh, questions answered. I'm going to be answering questions as long as I'm talking. It can be about financing or anything, mobile home park investing, uh, real estate investing, entrepreneurship, whatever you want. I'll answer anything. It doesn't really matter. Um, or just chime in. Let me know where you're, where, you're, uh, where you're at in your investing career. If you bought one park, multiple, or just getting started. All right. So uh, the first thing that I want to go over is kind of the basics. All right. So when you're buying a mobile home park, lenders are looking at a couple different things, a few different things, especially uh, it's, it's going to especially determine on the type of mobile home park and the size of the park. Lenders are going to be looking at, um, your finance ability, which is kind of what we're used to, right? We're used to talking to banks and giving them our personal financials. And they're looking into us as a credible borrower, but believe it or not, um, other than other than one lender type, the other lenders aren't so worried so much about you as a borrower. They're actually more interested in the asset that they're financing than you and the income that 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 property produces to cover their debt service or their mortgage payments. So that's a big relief. You don't have to have crazy wealth in order to buy these properties if you're buying good properties. Okay. Second thing that they're looking at. Um, so it's, it's your, it's your, um, net worth, your liquidity and your credit are going to be your personal. Then they're looking at what the property can produce from a cash flow standpoint going exceeding over the debt. We call it a debt service coverage ratio. And, um, they are looking at other things too, like loan to value and, um, what, what kind of risk that they're potentially taking on. But ultimately they're looking at the property often a lot more than you. Um, one cool thing about this that a lot of people don't know in commercial real estate, it's very common to bring on an additional co-sponsor they're called or a loan sponsor into a deal to sign on the loan to help guarantee it. If there is a guarantee, um, based on their credit, liquidity, net worth, and experience, which is the third thing that they want. They want to know that you've got the experience or someone in the management team has experience. So if you don't have one of those things, you can actually partner up with somebody else. They come into the deal. They go on the loan with you with their credibility, credit, cash, liquidity, uh, net worth, all of that, and get the deal done. So I see that a lot. Um, uh, we got somebody jo jumped on and said, hey, have five small parks and looking for more and struggling to find deals. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that too. Um, from there. Uh, yeah. So that's what the banks are looking for. You can, you can bridge the gap by bringing on other partners who have what the banks are looking at, uh, looking for if you don't have them. But then also what's great about this is that there's, uh, there are um, recourse and non-recourse options, which isn't the same in the residential world. In residential world, you pretty much have recourse debt, meaning you're personally sign signing a guarantee on that loan. So if you default, 
they are going to go after you and all of your assets personally. But most, I shouldn't say most, some of the lenders are we're willing to do non-recourse loans, which means you don't actually have to personally sign, just the entity that owns the property signs as the borrower and guarantees the performance. If you, for some reason, do not perform, they take the property, you lose a lot of money, yes, but they don't go after you personally for the losses. There are a few little carve-outs in those terms, but I'm not telling you to go and get into deals that you could potentially, you know, fail on because who cares? What I'm telling you is that there's an opportunity to continue to scale your portfolio. What a lot of people think of when they think of real estate investing is in the single family world, you're limited to the number of loans you can do. They look at you and they go, you can only do this much in, you can only go this much in debt to buy these homes because they're looking at you personally, right? But in commercial real estate, especially with non-recourse debt, those do not; those loans do not count against um, your personal financials. All right. So when they're non-recourse, they don't consider that a personal risk to you. So therefore, you can continue to grow your portfolio well beyond um, what you could with single-family homes. So those are a couple things that you want to think about when buying mobile home parks with lenders. Um, Let's talk about the different types of loans or the different types of lenders for the different types of properties. If you're buying a property that's between a hundred thousand and a million dollars um, for the loan amount, I should say, if the loan amount is going to be between a hundred thousand dollars and a million dollars, you're probably going with a bank. Okay. And that could be a local bank, credit union, regional bank doesn't really matter. It's going to be a bank loan for the most part. Most of the other types of lenders are not going to go into the um, into the smaller loan balances because of how they get their money and at the scale that they're lending. Banks have relatively limited uh, funding capabilities, and so they will do those smaller loans. Now, with banks... Um, Okay, so banks are going to be a hundred thousand to nine hundred ninety-nine thousand for the loan amount, but also banks are going to be really good when you are borrowing for the short term, meaning you're either planning on selling the property within your, you know, within call it five years or so, five to seven years. Banks are going to be good, and the shorter you're going to hold, the more likely you're going to want to go with a bank as well. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, but hey guys, if you guys have questions, drop in the comments, any questions you have about mobile home park investing, estate investing, entrepreneurship, whatever, I'll answer them while we're talking here. Um, or if you're, if you want, drop in the comments kind of where you're at in your investing career with mobile home parks or whatever, single families, doesn't matter. I just kind of want to hear where everybody's at. Um, drop that in the comments as we're talking here. Okay. So we talked about kind of banks and being the go-to for smaller balance loans and shorter term. And the reason why you want to go with banks for shorter term loans is because their prepayment penalties are more reasonable. Give an example, okay? Typically a bank will be, um, if they're going to have a prepayment penalty, they're going to have like a step down or they're going to have some sort of graduated uh, prepayment, prepayment schedule. And it's probably going to be pretty feasible. It's going to be like, if it's a three-year prepayment penalty, it's going to be three years, two years, one year, um, are going to be 3%, 2%, 1%. So you could sell a property, pay 2% of the loan balance and get out of it. It's not going to be that cost prohibitive for the most part. Or after three years, you may not even have a prepayment penalty. I've seen it go all the way from five years. So like five, four, three, two, one, um, all the way, you know, all the way down to just 1% across the board, they're pretty flexible, okay? So if you plan on taking a property, maximizing the value on it, and then turning around and refinancing it, or turning around and selling it, you don't want something with a really high prepayment penalty. That is going to um, be very expensive to get out. Um, hey, guys. Drop in the comments if you got questions about mobile home park investing, real estate investing, entrepreneurship, whatever, or let me know where you're at 
if you're just getting started in real estate investing or if you already own stuff. I'd love to hear in the comments. Um, all right. So with that, short-term holds or short-term loans, you want to go with banks. If you're, if you're, the property is already running really well and you want to own this property for a longer period of time or, um, or you, don't, uh, you don't need to refinance for a while, then you might want to look at other lending types because those are going to probably have more attractive terms, but they're more expensive to get out of. All right. Let's jump into the next type of lender, and that is going to be institutional lenders. Institutional lenders are going to be good for loans with a million dollars or more. Now, don't check out here, okay? Because sometimes people are like, oh, I'm not going to be buying parks with multi-million dollar loans on them. Well, here's the thing. Often, you will buy a park with a loan that's under a million dollars, make the improvements to it, and then refinance to get your cash out okay, and get back to where you have no money in the deal. And then your loan amount is going to be more than a million dollars because you've created all this value, which is what's so exciting about commercial real estate and the abil ability to maximize, you know, to increase value very quickly through, um, you know, different management strategies and improvements that you can do to a property. Um, hey guys, drop in the comments. If you got any questions, happy to answer them. So basically you, you buy the property, might be over a million dollar loan in the beginning, or maybe in the beginning you buy it, you go with the bank, and then once you've added the value, then you refinance into the larger loans, okay? Now, institutional lenders fall under a few different types, and let's talk about those. Um, agency is a very common one. Agency you have in residential world, right? That's Fannie and Freddie loans. And so these loans have really sexy terms. These terms are going to be typically a 30-year amortization. They're going to be very attractive interest rates usually. Um, they're going to be non-recourse for the most part. And you can even get uh, some agency loans that will go full amortization, meaning you never have to refinance again. They go full term. You just keep paying and eventually you own the property free and clear. They're one of the few lenders that will do that, Okay. Um, and these are kind of the cream of the crop lenders. These are the lenders you want it, you want to be able to get. They're going to be definitely more picky with the type of um, properties that they're going to finance. They're going to want to see more double wise. They're going to see a little higher quality property is what they're going for for the most part. They'll even talk to you about things like curbing and, you know, um, they're going to be definitely more picky on park owned homes and just some of that other stuff. Okay. Um, so agency is a great lender if you can get into them. The prepayment penalties are high, okay? They're going to be higher for the most part than banks. Um, commercial lenders, uh, I'm sorry, commercial mortgage-backed securities are the next type of lender. And that's, you might have heard the term CMBS or conduit lenders. These guys are basically syndicating Okay, they're pooling loans together and then selling ownership of those loans, the pool of loans, out to uh, either um, larger institutional investors or um, even sometimes private private lenders or private investors as well. So these guys are kind of like, I guess you could say they're probably a lot more flexible than the agency lenders because they're not holding the loans. This is a group of, and this is a group that basically says, "Hey, let's go um, get." And I'm going to get a little technical here, so bear with me. Um, but let's say they go, "Let's go to Wells Fargo. Let's go get a big line of credit. Let's go take that money and let's go lend it to a bunch of these people. Let's go lend it a bunch of it to Mario and these other people to buy these mobile home parks. Then once we have all these loans, we're going to package them up. We're going to create an entity." that owns all of these loans, this paper, okay, that all this, all these lenders, I'm sorry, all these loans are um, basically owned by this entity. And then what they do is they go get a securities attorney to help them sell shares or ownership of that entity. That's the most simple way I can explain uh, commercial mortgage-backed securities or CMBS. But because they don't hold on to those loans for the most part, they're not quite as picky. They're packaging it up and selling it based on a rating and, and they're making their money and they're out. Okay. There are some 
little caveats there where they get back involved and they do sometimes retain a little bit of ownership, but they're selling it to the blind pool, the blind investors that don't really understand what they're buying. Okay. Um, that being said, their terms are going to be pretty, pretty good as well. You're going to get the 30 year amortization. You're going to get um, non-recourse. It's almost always non-recourse that again, the term, the interest rates can be pretty good. One little scary uh, thing to think about and know, uh, kind of a fun fact too, is that on CMBS loans or conduit loans, they will actually lock your rate the day of closing. Okay. Which think about that. They quote you a rate in the beginning, but based on where the market adjusts, whatever index they're tying it to, wherever the market is on the day of closing is the rate that you get. It's kind of cool. They call you from the trading floor and they're like, Hey, we're here. We want to lock your rate. Some random trader. I don't even know who it is, but they're basically like, "Look, we're we're locking you in on a rate today. Where this is where we're at right now." And they get all they give you all these technical numbers, which is kind of weird. I don't know why they don't just give you the total, you know, your your combined rate. But so usually it comes down to me saying, "Okay, so in English, what's my rate going to be?" They tell you, and they go, "Are we good to lock?" And it's like, "Yes, lock." It's kind of like it's like blast off, right? Um, but kind of cool, uh, unique, a little scary, definitely a little bit of adrenaline going because you don't know what the rate is going to be until you get on the phone. Um, there is some rate risk with those type of loans. I would recommend doing them more on refinances than purchases because then you're not um, at, their, at their mercy and big swings could affect you. Hey, we got some uh, more comments coming in here. I'm going to pause. Uh, Bradley said, how can I buy using an uh, novation agreement, and do you have one that you can share? Okay, so um, great question, Bradley. So one thing that I'm going to tell you is I don't know anybody uh, flipping or wholesaling um, mobile home parks with novations. Novations are pretty new over the last few years. Something, honestly, being out of the single family world, for a while was kind of like, what the heck is that? And then when I started, uh, when I got my head around, I'm like, that's pretty cool. Um, but I don't know anybody selling mobile home parks on Novations. I obviously know people sell parks on assignments, but because there's not your standard multiple listing service, like you have in the residential world, um, you don't have that, uh, that easy, I'm gonna quickly list this mobile home park and uh, within the timelines, and I guess I guess what I'm saying is I don't know because I don't know anybody else doing it. You should be the first guy to do it. Um, but there's definitely a lot of assignments happening, and a lot of people that tie up properties and sell the contract, and or you know do double closings and things like that. But haven't seen innovations yet. Um, great question though. All right, and then. Uh, Looking at, oh, and let me just tell you guys what innovations are, because there's some people probably going, what the heck is that? In simple terms, you go get the property tied up, okay, with a contract, and this is very common in the single family world now, you go get the property tied up, and then you turn around and you do an ovation, and I've never personally done one, but basically you swap out the new contract with an end buyer for the old one. So the old, this new buyer, this new investor pays you and they step in with their own terms uh, with that seller. It's pretty cool, actually. Um, great question, Bradley. Uh, somebody said, I, I can't see the name, but looking in Virginia. Um, so cool. Welcome. I own in uh, closest to Virginia that I own is Pennsylvania. Um, keep an eye out for me. Love to do a deal up there. And uh, somebody said, what's up, Mario? But I don't see the name, so you can drop your name so I know who it is. Guys, if you're on Facebook, you got to do like, look look up above and there's like a, some instructions so that your names pop up on the screen for me because Facebook is goofy. Um, all right, so back to what I was talking about. If you guys got other questions, drop them in the comments and um, we will. I'll make sure to uh, answer them or let me know where you're at in your real estate investing career right now. So... Commercial mortgage-backed securities are pretty cool. I've done quite a few of them, the CMBS loans. And I would say something to think about. Oh, what's up, Marshall? All right. Um, uh, one thing that you want to think about with um, 
with uh, CMBS is the prepayment penalties. They typically will have what's called defeasance. And I'm not going to educate you on defeasance. That's super technical. We get into that uh, in real cash flow coaching. I get into quite a bit of detail on how they work and the nuances of it. But just to understand this, um, the prepay penalties can be very, very expensive. I've defeased one time and that cost me $350,000 to pay off the loan. It was still profitable to do, so I did it. Um, but, uh, and, and, the, and the financials on the deal made sense to do it that way. But, you know, that's a, that's a nice house <laughs> um, that, you, that you're basically paying in prepayment penalties to pay off the loan if you're paying it off early. So just make sure that you're using CMBS loans or conduit loans for deals that you're going to hold for a very long time. Um, what's up, Shannon? Good to have you on. And uh, she's in South Carolina. Shannon's a rock star. Um, thanks for being on. All right. Um, so one thing that I'd say about CMBS loans is that if you've got a deal that's maybe not, I don't want to use the word gritty, but if you've got a deal that's just not quite as sexy, physically not as pretty of a property, CMBS is probably your route. They're going to be a little less picky like we talked about. Um, so consider them. You're not going to a CMBS lender directly. Um, you're going to go through a broker. That's basically the, the, the route that you're going to go for the CMBS stuff. Let's talk, excuse me, if you guys got questions about mobile home parks, real estate investing, entrepreneurship, whatever, what I had for dinner, drop it in the, drop it in the comments and I'll make sure to answer them or just let me know kind of where you're at, what you're doing in real estate. If you're just getting started, I'd love to hear from you guys. Um, the next type of institutional lender, um, is, uh, the, um, is the, um, life companies. I just got another comment here. Defees with ease. Defeasance, no bueno in arbitra arbitrage markets, Mike. Yeah, I mean, um, defeasance is uh, honestly not not very easy <laughs> and not cheap, and it's very complex. Uh, those prepayment structures you get, I, I I can usually keep up with, you know, legal jargon. And when attorneys are talking, they're getting super complicated. I, I can usually follow kind of what's going on. But that was one of the few times that I ever was on a call with attorneys where I just sat back and went, um, you guys are over, this is over my head. Just um, you, you guys talk, figure it out. And they're like, so what do you think about this one? I'm like, I don't know. My attorney is just going to make the decision for me because it's over my head. It gets very complex. And then you get the financial markets involved. It's, it's complicated. Um, yeah, their defeasance is uh, um, expensive. Uh, and, and sometimes it makes sense, but, you know, again, you just want to pick deals with, um, defeasance or yield maintenance type prepayment penalties wisely. You don't go into those loans without at least understanding your timelines and when you're going to want to pay them off. <clears throat> um, so great, great input. Um, all right. So the la the next institutional lender I want to talk about is life companies, um, take a sip of water here. If you guys got comments or questions, drop them in the comments right now, whether it's mobile home parks, commercial real estate, real estate investing, entrepreneurship, whatever. Or just let me know what you're investing in um, or if you're just getting started. All right, cool. Life companies. So this is kind of weird because you're like life companies, life insurance companies. Why would life insurance companies be a lender in mobile home parks or in com commercial real estate? Well, the fact is, is they've got a lot of cash. They got a lot of liquidity from all the premiums being paid in. And so what they do is they take that cash and they turn around and they invest it into debt. So they lend money to investors like you and me who are buying commercial real estate. And that's how they earn a return on all the premiums that they're bringing in. Okay. Um, and so these guys are kind of interesting because the life companies, they're not in like a perfect box in the sense that, um, that they aren't, they're not, um, I'll answer that question or I'll, uh, <clears throat> I'll give you a, give you an answer on that in one second. Um, they're, they're not in a box. 
they're they're kind of like a blend between the banks and the agency lenders. <clears throat> you can get very great terms. You can get loans with 30-year amortizations. You can get um, very good interest rates, non-recourse options. Um, not always, but sometimes they'll do non-recourse options. They're a little more finicky, kind of like the agency lenders. They, they want better quality properties and they are, um, you know, I would say they're going to be a little bit lower loan to value. They're great for refinancing, not so good for purchasing, especially if you're buying value add deals where you're going to buy it here and sell it here. Um, you're typically going to go to these guys once you got your property nice and cleaned up and get great terms with them. <clears throat> um, 30 year AM is common, not always, um, but they will do 25. But the interesting thing about them is they differ um, lender to lender. Let me answer this question that came in. I don't know who asked this because they didn't put their name at the end, but looking for a virtual assistant to find me parks, any leads. Um, so maybe uh, be a little bit more clear on what you're asking for, like leads of parks or leads for virtual assistants. And what exactly are you having them do to find you parks? Um, because that's kind of a broad, um, broad question there. Uh, I got another question here. Uh, Matador Mike, I like the name, man. That's actually pretty cool. Uh, I watched your video on evaluating mobile home parks. Sadly, there's a good deal in my area that I'm not prepared to invest. Uh, invest in 170 pads for 1.5 million paved roads, city sewer, city water. Yeah, dude. Um, so. On that, oh man, he's giving us the whole deal breakdown. Uh, lot rents are below market if raised to market and filled could be refinanced. Yeah, um, what you want to do is you want to uh, shoot me an email, <laughs> Mario Dottillo. I'm sorry, Mario at MarioDottillo.net. It's Mario at MarioDottillo.net. Let's talk. Um, and we do a deal together or... Uh, we do something together on that. Hit me up, Mario at MarioDetillo.net. Sounds interesting for sure. Um, that's right in my wheelhouse. So uh, thanks, Matador Mike. Let's do something, bro. Let's make some money together. Um, all right. Uh, so where was I? Life companies. If you guys got questions or have any, uh, oh, here we go. Got another one. Yep. Uh, yeah. If you guys got questions or want uh, have any questions, uh, uh, questions about real estate investing, mobile home park investing, or um, uh, entrepreneurship, just drop them in the comments. These are, this is really good stuff. We're doing deals together now too. So that's, uh, <laughs> that, that makes this discussion very, very profitable for everybody. Um, all right. So long story short, life companies are a great loan type. You're typically going to do them through a broker that specializes in it. Um, you know, with with um, kind of a high level breakdown. So you've got the banks, then you got the institutional lenders, which are the which are the um, agency lenders like Fannie Freddie, the CMBS slash conduit lenders, and then the life companies under the institutional type lenders. And one thing I wanted to point out is that you know, in addition to rates being higher and lenders being a little bit more strict. Lenders are doing lower loan to value than they were in the past. Like I was just texting with my um, my my commercial broker, and he's like, "I said, what are you seeing? What's going on? What's changing?" And he said, "Well, we're doing much much lower loan to value loans, which is interesting. Um, you know, typically you could get with a bank, you'd probably be, you know, sixty five to seventy five percent loan to value. Most of these institutional lenders about the same, but you know, they're talking, you know, closer to like 55 to 65 percent uh, loan to value loans. Although I know that we've been quoted on some things just recently that were 75 percent from banks. So don't let that scare you. It's just interesting to know that, you know, banks are getting stricter. They're being a little bit more picky. And frankly, with the interest rates where they are, you kind of need to go with a little bit lower loan to value to make it work. Um but uh, let's talk about how to get banks. Banks are going to be, for the most part, just dialing for dollars. Okay, you're going to be calling up banks, getting um, getting them 
uh, pre-qualified, see if they're not notice. I didn't say you pre-qualified. I say you're pre-qualifying them to see if they're a good bang for you. Um, but yeah, you're pretty much going to do dialing for dollars. If you're going institutional or you want some help, you can always go to a broker. Now this is not like a general commercial real estate broker. You're going to want it. I'm sorry, mo, uh, general commercial, uh, mortgage broker. This is going to be a mobile home park specific commercial uh, mortgage broker or commercial lender, they call themselves. But you're going to want to go to somebody who really knows mobile home parks specifically um, because they're going to have great lenders for you, both on the institutional and on the bank side. They charge a fee, of course, but who cares? They're, they're going to pitch it better than you ever are. And uh, unless you're doing local banks, that's kind of the route you want to go. I wouldn't be trying to source institutional debt um, without a broker. It's just not even worth it. Um, and you're probably not going to get a deal done. Um, all right. One thing that we haven't talked about yet tonight, and this is something that a lot of people want to talk about right now and want to know how to do. Um, before we get into that, though, drop in the comments if you guys have any questions about real estate investing, mobile home park investing, entrepreneurship, Whatever you guys want, drop it in the comments or let me know what you're investing in or if you're getting ready to invest in, in real estate of any type, I want to hear from you. Um, all right. So also click like or uh, share this too if, if, if you're getting some good value out of this. <clears throat> um, so the one area that we have not talked about yet is seller financing. Okay. So there's tons of liquidity. There's a lot of banks with a lot of appetite for mobile home parks, um, which is something that most people don't realize and kind of keeps them out of the world of investing in mobile home parks because they think there's not bank financing, but there is. But with interest rates being where they're at and things being a little bit more on the lending side being a little bit tighter, um, sellers are a lot more open to carrying financing lately. And I'd say um, we just closed on one, uh, actually it was a self-storage facility. It wasn't even a mobile home park. It doesn't really matter. Last month, that was um, same same thing. Um, that was seller financed. I closed a deal in December. That was seller financed. Um, sorry, that was November. Yeah, and December. Both months were seller financed. So there's definitely sellers more being more open to carrying paper. Now, one thing that you've got to remember is that um, approaching these sellers, asking for seller financing has to be done uh, probably in a different way than what most people would do. Most people would be, be like, hey, will you carry financing on this property? Will you carry paper on this? That's not the approach. And we don't have time to get into like detail, everything to say script wise and all of that, but <clears throat> it's more of the approach. Okay. Your approach can't be, I need you to finance it. It's your property and you need me to allow you to carry financing on it and not pay you off in cash. Um, and so it's more of your approach and there's definitely some strategies to do that. Um, seller financing home offices, are actively seeking um, multi and commercial real estate mobile home. Um, I think you mean family offices, um, but yes. So seller financing is what we're talking about. And then family offices are uh, actively buying uh, mobile home parks. So there's probably some finance, some family offices that are financing them too. Um, there's also some private debt funds that will finance them. We didn't get into, but we go way more into detail of that um, in my coaching program. But the whole point is that there's definitely a lot of financing options. <clears throat> One thing that's kind of cool about seller financing is um, it's really wide open. I mean, anything goes. Whatever you can do with a seller that makes it a win-win situation, you can do. You know, give me an example. I bought a deal not too long ago. This was in November, I want to say. And I talked to the seller and I'm like, hey, um, what about seller? What, if, what about interest only for the first year? Okay. Which isn't, that's not a huge ask. Banks do that all the time. Right. Um, <clears throat> but I said, what about, what about interest only in year one? Because, yeah, we could maybe do that. Or what if I gave you 
no payments for, I think he said four months. He goes, what if we, what, if, you know, to help you out, what if I also gave you zero payments for four months, the first four months of ownership? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> sounds really good to me. Um, and so, you know, anything really goes because the seller and you are just putting a deal together. And I mean, you can, you, you can structure deals with better than bank financing. What a lot of people do is they go into seller financing and they go, okay, I need seller financing because I'm not bankable or I don't have great credit or I don't have all this cash or whatever it is that they think is holding them up to, from getting bank financing. And so they go to the seller and they say, hey, you know, Mr. Seller, will you finance this deal? And what, it, you know, what interest rate will you give me? And, you know, they go in with the expectation that their interest rates are going to be higher and the terms aren't going to be as good as the bank. I go in totally different. I go in and say, you need to make, you need to beat the bank in order to do this because otherwise I can just go to the bank and the bank will, you know, give me all the cash to do it. But yeah, the price might be a little different. Um, the whole point is I don't go in expecting to be, um, to have higher interest rate than the bank, especially right now. That's how you make the deals work. You say, Hey, look, interest rates are 7% with bank with the bank. That's not going to work for me, uh, especially at your price. But if you can give me 5% or four and a half percent, okay. Five and a half percent, wherever you want to be, wherever the numbers work, I can get you closer to your price, right? I can be at your price because now the cash flow, okay, works then. Where at seven and a half percent or seven percent or six and a half percent, the numbers don't work. And so I use seller financing to um, to offset the cost of the debt so that I can then still buy the deals. Okay, here's the catch with that. Okay, and I want to put this out. A lot of people are like, yeah, I'll buy. I've heard a lot of people say this, and it's kind of scary. They'll be like, "Yeah, I don't care what I pay for a property as long as the terms, you know, work for me." And I'm like, "Okay, well, I get it in concept, yes, but that is only if you aren't thinking of the downside risk." And <clears throat> you know, there's the the whole point of buying a property is not only cash flow, but also equity, right? I want to build my net worth. So am I going to pay way over value for a property just because I've got good terms or good cash flow? No, because if I want to sell that property at some point, okay, um, I want to be able to exit. But if I can't exit because I owe too much on it, then, you know, we got a problem. So, hey, guys, if you got questions, drop them in the chat or in the comments, whether it's uh, mobile home parks or uh uh, real estate investing or entrepreneurship, whatever you want, or let me know where, what you're doing in real estate or if you're just getting started, I'd love to hear from you. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, don't just, don't just pay any price or be willing to overpay by a long shot just because the seller's financing it. That's just um, responsible. That being said, can you, can you sometimes pay a premium? Sure. Yeah. Because, you know, if you're going to hold it for 10 years and you're, and you know you you can pay 10 15 percent over maybe what you could today because you're gonna hold it a long time and the terms work out that way so it definitely helps um, when you can work out terms with your seller um let's see here we got another question uh what's your take on selling notes to uh qib or funds to fund with uh, OPM. So I don't even know what QIB is. Um, maybe you can drop in the comments what QIB stands for, but, um, I've bought loans. I mean, I've bought, I've bought and, uh, trying to think if I sold any loans. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I've actually sold any loans, but I've definitely bought loans, both performing and non-performing loans. Um, and then I'm not quite sure what you mean by to fund with other people's money. Um, I mean, I use OPM, other people's money, all the time in deals, both for debt and equity. Um, but yeah, ultimately, um, yeah, I think you just need to maybe, uh, working man capital, if you could just maybe clarify what you're asking, just spell it out a little bit more because abbreviations and things, I, I, I'm i sorry, I don't know what uh, QIB is. But um that being said, 
you know, let's take that conversation a little bit to the side. Um, oh, qualified institutional buyers. Yeah. So are you saying that you, uh, what's your take on selling notes? Oh, you mean just, uh, doing like private loans and then, uh, to yourself and then turning around and selling the loan off. Is that kind of what you're saying? Um, I haven't done that. Um, I think, you know, for, you can get super creative on all this and you can even tell your seller, look, Hey, you know, why don't you do a loan? And then you could turn around and sell this loan to institutional buyers, you know, um, or funds, if that's kind of what you're saying. Um, there is liquidity. There are markets that you can sell private loans off in. They're not going to be always the most attractive terms, but there's, there is liquidity there. If they, especially if the note is, <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, especially if the terms are going to be attractive to a loan buyer. We're getting kind of in the weeds here. We're getting pretty technical. But if the terms of the loan are good for the lender, maybe not so much the borrower, then there's probably going to be more buyers interested in buying those loans off of your, your seller. So there, there is liquidity. Um, but a lot of times, too, keep in mind, sellers don't want all the cash. Like I met with one today, super good guy, but he's like, I don't want to be paid off. I'm like, okay, what do you mean? He's like, we don't, we do not want to be, we don't want to cash out sale. We we need to carry paper on this. And it's like, what do they need the money for? He even said, I, I don't know where I'm going to put the money and it means I got to pay taxes on all of it. I just want the income and I, I don't need it. I don't want to deal with the property anymore. And so there's, um, there are a lot of reasons why sellers want to carry paper, carry financing. <clears throat> so don't go into it with they're doing you a favor. You're doing them as much of a favor as they're doing you to make the deal work. Bradley, I'm helping owners turn around parks to increase value. Um, I've been in property management for 30 years and have uh, authored two books on property management. I'm open to working with everyone and open to creative ways uh, we can work together. Cool, man. Sounds good. All right. Um, so yeah, let's, uh, let's see here. Um, so before I forget, if you guys got any questions, drop in the chat, uh, or drop in the comments, I will, um, definitely answer them. As you can see, it's kind of like whatever people say you get, you know, I'm going to answer your questions for sure. Regardless of the topic, whether it's mobile home parks, commercial real estate, resi real estate, whatever you want financing, we're talking about selling off loans now. I mean, we can take this wherever you want, but, um, for the most part, I want to keep it on track with lending. Um, so there's still tons of opportunity by these mobile home parks because there are a lot of loan options, whether it's whether it's um, you know banks, institutional lenders, or private financing. One thing that we didn't talk about either that I think we should touch on is private lenders. Whether it's hard money, which is kind of what a lot of people think of, especially coming out of residential, they think hard money lenders, which are going to be pretty expensive, low loan to value. Well, yeah, probably lower loan to value. They're going to have personal guarantees often. And they're really looking at the asset. Do they want to take it from me? Hey, it makes it sound, makes them sound bad, but it's just a good business model for them. Interest rates are going to be pretty high with a lot of fees and everything. But, you know, um, I've never bought a mobile home park with hard money. I wouldn't recommend it. If you got to buy it with hard money, there's probably a reason for that. And you better make sure that you can get that property turned around pretty quick and that you can get to a cash flowing standpoint as fast as possible. Otherwise you might be losing the property. On the other hand though, outside of hard money, there's also just private lenders. There's private investors that want to lend their money um, and they're willing to take a little bit better rates and terms than, you know, like your hard money lenders. And you can find these people almost anywhere. A lot of them actually have self-directed IRAs. Um, uh, self-directed IRAs or self-directed 401ks. Welcome, dude. Thanks for, thanks for chiming in. Let me know what other questions else you want to talk about. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of private money out there. People with just money sitting in bank accounts. People sell stuff all the time and they're like, crap, I got all this money now. What am I going to do with it? And they don't maybe want to go in as an investor and be a equity investor or an owner with you, but they'd rather lend money. And so that's a great opportunity to network with people and have them lend you their private money. Cool thing about lending is there's no securities law involved. Okay. It's a loan. So you can, I can publicly say, Hey, 
who wants to lend me, you know, a million dollars right now at 5% interest for five years? I can say that publicly. It's they're lending me. It's a loan, right? They get a, they get a lien on the property. So there's a lot less restrictions around that. That being said, don't let um, securities law scare you on the equity side in the sense of as long as you comply with the law and you have a good securities attorney advising you on it and you're doing things by the books, it's it's not that hard to follow the law and um, it's it's not difficult. So people think that it's just so complicated or they they, they cheap out and they don't want to get a, a securities attorney to do it right and they end up getting themselves in a lot of trouble. So just do it right. It's not a big deal. Um, but you know, this business is super fun. It is a really fun business and this kind of came to me today as I was riding in, in a truck with uh, my acquisition manager <clears throat> and uh, and an owner of a park. Like I have a lot of fun doing this. There's there's not many businesses that you can um, you can talk you can kind of like make millions of dollars, okay, and have you know uh, um, build real wealth, I guess you could say, but still be blue collar. You know what I mean? And what I mean by that is that I'm running around with these guys that have built these mobile home parks with their bare hands, like literally shovels digging up the pipeline, you know, where they're going to put down the, the water lines and the sewer lines. And they've developed these parks over many years. And, you know, they've lived in the park sometimes with their tenants. And it's just, it's, it's really unique. And what it really makes you realize is, you know, these guys are like blue collar multimillionaire people that are just so down to earth and have just, just built it with their bare hands and really created a financial legacy for them and their families um, and it's just pretty cool. Um, and, and, and I don't know how else to describe it other than when you listen to them tell stories, I did a post about this like an hour ago. Um, after I got back, I was thinking about it. I was like, man, to be able to sit down and listen to somebody who just took a piece of dirt that maybe they bought on seller financing 50 years ago, and they just started digging lines and, you know, um, bringing in homes and slowly doing this stuff. It's, it's, it's really cool. I, I don't know how else to put it. It's like you get a sneak peek into history, like somebody telling you how stuff was done and you get to kind of hear their life story. And just, um, I, I, I don't know, you just have to experience it. Like that is one cool benefit to being in this business because we are buying from a lot of old timers and a lot of, you know, mom and pops that have been in the game for a really long time and just being able to ride along in their pickup trucks and like hear the stories. And it's, um, I don't know, I, maybe I'm just, you know, having a, having a midlife crisis and, and, uh, thinking, thinking at my life a little bit too hard when I listen to them, but it's, it's, uh, it makes you really go, wow. I want to build something where I can not only, you know, build wealth, but really build a, build a, um, a legacy that I can tell my kids and grandkids and all that stuff about too. So pretty cool. Um, so yeah, I mean, just if you guys aren't buying mobile home parks right now and you want to, like right now is seriously a good time to be doing it. Um, get, get educated on it. Of course, you know, doing bigger deals, obviously takes knowledge and you're not going to learn that through, you know, Instagram reels and YouTube shorts and all that. And I try and give you guys as much value as possible. So definitely, you know, if you're not checking out, subscribe to my YouTube channel, do it. It's free. It's Mario But, um, there's only so much that you can get out of a short form content or even a 10 minute video or even one of these lives. So, you know, get, get, get educated on it. Don't go blindly buying things and losing money. Um, but you can really build wealth with just, you know, a few parks. You don't have to be Donald Trump and, and that is not a political statement, but, um, if it is, so what, uh, you don't have to be a Donald Trump or any of these huge investors to become super wealthy. You could do a few deals um, and really, you know, set yourself up for life. I mean, you can do one deal. Yeah, I, I'm pretty young, Bradley. I'm 38. I know I just turned 39 a couple of weeks ago. Holy crap, I'm getting old. Um, but yeah, I mean, start out wherever you're at. If you're young, 
don't let that scare you. I started investing in real estate when I was, I think, 21, 22, something like that. Um, or if you're later in age, don't let that scare you either. No, there's no better time to start doing it than now. But you can, you can literally make seven figures on one deal. My first park that I ever bought, and this is not bragging, this is saying, hey, look, the first deal when I knew the least amount about mobile home park investing, I bought that deal and made seven figures when I sold it a few years later <clears throat> um, and made great cash flow from it. So it's it's you can you can get really wealthy um, with just a few deals. You don't have to uh, be be a huge investor in any of this. Um, so yeah, if you guys want to learn more about how to do this stuff, you can uh, uh, private message me the word learn at any time and I'll get you info or you can just go to getrealcashflow.com, learn about how I'm helping people do this. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's, there's a lot to learn going from like buying single family houses and duplexes to buying commercial real estate, no matter what property type, even if it's self storage or apartments or retail, industrial, whatever it is, um, office, you, you really do need to get educated on it. It's like a little mini college education so that you can go out and do it the right way. Cause there's big stakes. Like you can make millions, but you could also lose a lot too. If you, you know, like somebody came to me and was like, Hey, I'm going to do this deal because you know, it's a little bit tight. It, I shouldn't, he shouldn't, shouldn't say it was a little bit tight. I think he said it's, it's really tight. Um, but it's zero down. The person will literally give me the park and I can just take it over. And I'm like, Whoa, <laughs> careful. There's a reason why they're giving it to you a zero down. And uh, there's a lot, there's probably some risk there that you need to look into because you could lose more than you realize. Um, Bradley said, uh, would you do rentals of mobile homes in parks or have only homeowners and do space rents? Okay. So this is a great question. Um, yeah. I mean, I, all my parks are lot rent only. Um, I mean, we have a couple of rentals, but it's really just because we inherited them and we we're working on transitioning them to lot rent. But that's and that's why you guys need to go to this event. I know it sounds like I'm promoting a lot, but uh, on the 27th of April in Lafayette, Louisiana, at Chris Rude's house, he's doing a big event. Um, and uh, what's cool about that is that Chris is big into the rental model. So he rents a lot of homes in his communities and has done very well at it. So like it's it's just a different business model where I'm the opposite. I have lot rent communities. And so we're going to be talking about the differences between those, I'm sure. And uh, it's going to be pretty cool. But yeah, for me, I, I, I just um, own lot rent communities. But here's the thing. I don't want anybody to think that means I won't buy an all rental community. I will buy a community that's all rentals. I've done it before. And then we convert that to a lot rent model to where you have all owners in the community. And um, so there's definitely some strategy involved in that. And I've learned the hard way a couple of times on that. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll buy a park that's all park owned homes if the numbers make sense when I convert it to a lot rent community. So yeah, definitely check out that event and um uh, hit up Chris Rude to get a seat if you guys want to go to that in Lafayette. It's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Um, April twenty seventh, I think it is. Um, it's not like a huge crowd. It's going to be a relatively small group, so it'll be like close communication. Everybody will be able to ask questions and talk through stuff. So it's going to be pretty cool. Um, uh, exactly what I've done with owners. Yep. <clears throat> um, so yeah, it's it's a it's a it's interesting because a lot of people will buy a park with rentals and then they think that it's always a good idea or a good strategy to turn around and sell all those homes to your renters. Well, I'm going to tell you right now, don't do that. Okay. And that goes against what I've heard other people teach. And the reason is because you might not want that renter to own that home because renters aren't necessarily owners in, in their mentality. They don't have the pride of ownership that an owner, a true owner has. So like I've heard a lot of people, especially getting into the business, like, yeah, I'm going to buy these park owned home, uh, this park with all these park owned homes. I'm just going to, you know, basically hand the keys over and the titles over to the renters so that they own them and don't have to maintain. Them. Well, when they don't take care of the homes, okay. Um, now you and and they don't take care of the neighborhood because they're really just a they're just a, a renter at heart. You just gave them a title. Um, 
you're going to have problems and then you're going to have a lot of turnover and they're not used to, you know, sticking and staying in place. Part of the reason why we buy mobile home parks is because the residents are sticky, right? So they stay there for a long time. You don't have all this turnover and everything, but if you're basically giving the title over to somebody and they're a renter, as soon as they don't want to pay, they're just going to leave because that's what they do. They, they're just renters, right? So um, if you really want the stability of, of, and, and the, and the benefit of one of the big benefits of owning mobile home parks, you need to be really strategic in how you convert those homes from a renter into an owner. And, um, there's, I've, I've learned the hard way, um, in a couple scenarios on that. So, um, anyways, yeah, good stuff, but, uh, all right. So let's wrap it up here. Uh, if you guys are, uh, want any, have any other questions or anything like that, you can drop them in the comments after we're done here and I will answer them. Okay. I will go back in over the next few days and just comment back, give you answers and make sure that I do get back to you. Um, Bradley recipe for failure, turning a tenant into an owner with no skin in the deal. Yeah. Especially with no skin in the deal. Like that's crazy. Um, but you know, the other thing is too, it going, going even further into that, even if they put some skin in the game, you need to really qualify that renter as an owner um, and make sure that there's someone that you want to permanently live in that park. Um, you may not want them to live in the park once you take ownership, once you realize who they are and meaning like who they are and, and how they pay and how they maintain their things and all of that. You, you want good uh, quality tenants living in your community as owners. Uh, Working Man Capital, what software do you use? for the entire due diligence and accounting rental software. Whoa, all right, we're getting into the weeds here. So um, for our property management software, we use Rent Manager. Um, Rent Manager was developed by mobile home park owners and um, it's the best one that we've seen. We, I've used Appfolio early, uh, Appfolio? Yeah, Appfolio early on, we used that and uh, just needed more robust software that was built more for mobile home parks. Um, there's a Yardy's got uh, Yardy Breeze, I think it's called, is for mobile home parks. Um, there's there's several. Um, Manage America, I believe, is another one. Um, most of the institutional investors or bigger operators either go on Manage America, Rent Manager, or Yardy. I'd say Manage America. There's one other one I'm forgetting, but um, Rent Manager has been good for us. <clears throat> and uh, don't go cheap on software. Um, you you will you get what you pay for, and I highly recommend going with a software that is not only a management software but also an accounting software, all uh, combined into one. So you don't have to do your operational reports and your accounting uh, reports in two separate platforms. That's that's crazy, I, uh, and that's one reason why we like Rent Manager over a couple of those other bigger softwares. You actually have to do your accounting separately. I just don't like it. I like, I want it all tied together. I want to be able to drill down from the tenant and their, and, and, and their information all the way down into um, their financials and any operational items. So great, great question. Um, due diligence, we use Monday. Um, and so we've got a checklist and all of that for everybody on the due diligence team. We track, you know, project management through, through Monday.com. Um, and then, uh, yeah, no problem, Bradley. Love to do some deals with you. Any way I can help you, just reach out. And uh, yeah, so guys, if you have questions that uh, if you're or if you're watching this after the recording, you're just watching the recording. You're welcome. Um, drop it in the comments, and I will come back and answer your questions and make sure that that I follow up with you. So it's been fun, guys. I have to go underwrite a deal right now because I'm, I got an offer to make first thing in the morning, face to face with an owner. So. Go make it happen. See you guys.